everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and right over there is Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Hi, Nikki Kinzer. Happy ADHD Day to you. Happy ADHD Day. Happy Organizing Day. It's yes, part two. Part two. two. Very excited about that. Yes. We are going to be talking about, uh, in a minute, we're going to be talking about sorting and purging, the second step in the organizing process. Very excited that we're taking this on. Uh, before we do that, head over to Take Control ADHD. You can get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website. Subscribe to the mailing list on the homepage right there. And you'll send you an email every time a new episode is released. You can also connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at Take Control ADHD. Uh, I have, I, we have a question, a listener question, which we, I'm yes. eager to talk about, but I have a safety update today. Oh. Are you ready for this? It's, it's brief. Okay. Safety update is thus. Uh, just a, a couple of, I think a week ago, probably should have talked about this last week. Uh, maybe it was just this this week. Uh, a a new collection of email addresses has been exposed, and it's a big one: two point two billion stolen usernames and passwords, seven hundred seventy three million mail addresses and passwords just landed on the net that are new. Uh, and I checked my handy dandy one password in the vulnerable passwords section and found a new forty six of my passwords have been exposed, and so it was time to change them. And so I am telling you all, if you're not using a password vault like one password that has a connection to uh, a service like have I been pwned dot com, uh, then you should be doing it. And if this is this is just another another reminder to get your password situation in order, it is it's like leaving your keys to your house on the front porch of your house and then going inside and locking the door. That's what is going on here. You've got to get your passwords in order. Every website should have a different password that you don't know that is long, that is completely uh, undecipherable. Uh, help get that in order. And Nikki, we should talk because some of the passwords in my vault uh, are passwords that you and I share. So we have some services we need to go about changing. Yeah. Um, so. Can I ask you a question? And yeah. I mean, maybe this, maybe you need to edit this out, but mm -hmm. um, when you say that, how do you, how do you, when you're in one password, how do you know what is vulnerable? Cause I'm not seeing where you would get that information. Well, in one password, that's a really great question. Uh, in one password, there is a section called watchtower. And if you don't have Watchtower uh, activated, open up your preferences on a Mac. You just hit command comma and that'll open your preferences window. And then you can hit the Watchtower option. And there's an option to say, that says check for compromised logins. And when you turn that on, it will update at daily. It'll check the service. Have I been pwned, which is have I been P W N E D dot com. And that is a service that uh, that goes about just hunting the Web for email addresses that have been uh, released in these major breaches in the dark Web. And so, it, you know, one password does the service of going in and comparing all of your user logins with what has been released on the web publicly and then it tells you hey this is a vulnerable password this is part of a password that's been compromised you should absolutely change this password as soon as possible and that's what you do you just go through your list and change passwords um, now i have a total of 645 uh, usernames and passwords in my one password vault and to have 46 of them violated in this last round 46 That's new scary. services that includes my utility company uh it includes my electric company it includes um uh you know it, it just it includes a lot linkedin instagram yeah. are kind of the the other ones but my utility companies those are those are new breaches to me so i just just please 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 let's let's keep our security house in order Thank okay. you for telling us. That's good to know. That's a project I'm going to work on today. Good. It's a project. It's an important one. And yeah, um, no kidding. There you have it. Okay. Let's talk about our opening question. Yes. A question from a fantastic uh, listener. And uh, uh, shall I read it? Yes. All right. But then I want you to answer it and then I'll add to it. Well, there's, you're I, giving me so much to do. I Well, do you want me to read it? No, no. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we, we'll talk about it. Here we go. How do I pull myself out of the avoidance spiral hole? 
I get overwhelmed. I put off what I need to do. I feel guilt and shame for not getting them done and then just further avoid having to confront my issues. I have such a hard time making myself deal with difficult situations that I make them bigger in my head and then do my best to hope the world doesn't come crashing down while I avoid them. Yep. Is is there a reason that you want me to answer this? Is, is, is am I should I no. read into this? <laughs> I just wanted you to re- I just wanted you to go first. That's all. <laughs> no particular reason. Just, I, I, everything that we talk about, I sort of read into just a little bit. Oh well, that that's history. No, that's a lot of no, history between us. Uh, no, no reason. No, I I mean I will start with the fact that. You know, she's not alone. This is, um, gosh, this is ADHD, right? And, you know, right in front of her avoidance, avoid the avoidance strategy doesn't work. Um, but it's hard to get out of. So no, I, I wanted your opinion because you have dealt with this. I'm sure. I mean, you know, we all have, well, we call this Monday is, (laughs) It it's is Monday. what we call this one. Yeah, definitely yeah. not alone. This is a it's a really hard thing to get over. And I, I think there are two there are two angles, uh, uh, maybe three. We're going to go with two. And if there's a third one, I still am still talking, then it'll be three. Uh, the first one is to remind yourself that you're not alone and that this is part of you know, living with ADHD. It's also part of overwhelm for people who haven't don't have ADHD. You can still overwhelm people that don't have ADHD. Uh, and so the avoidance spiral is a, it's a natural condition of humanity, right? Of, of right. living in a modern sort of the Anthropocene society or culture. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's something that you have to live with. And I think when you say that out loud daily, say, okay, this is, I'm, I know I'm avoiding this. I know it's part of who I am. It's part of my identity. Uh, it, that that goes so far to relieve a little bit of the weight on your shoulders, mm-hmm. just a little bit of the weight on your shoulders. Um, the second is that uh, for me, it, it all comes down to the adrenaline push at the very end. Right. I mean, I I have a pretty good track record of uh, getting things done at the very, very last minute. That's not a great way to live. Um, and it it hurts. It's emotionally draining um, and exhausting. But it's it's part of kind of my identity that I've come to sort of own and 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 leverage. And uh, at least once I do that and say this is who I am, then I can work on the accommodations that help me get get to the other side of it. And okay, three, uh, that accommodation looks like breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down. And sometimes it's what is the least offensive part of whatever I'm avoiding that I can get done in two minutes or less. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the what is the thing that if I know that I'm terrified about a certain project because it's just one giant project, what if I felt like I just had an ice pick and I could just pick off one Mm -hmm. tiny little thing to get done. Sometimes that's all you need is a little bit of that momentum and everything else just comes tumbling out. So um, I I feel like this idea, like we humans do a great job of making the weight of the world on our shoulders, you know, know, 10 times larger than it really is. You know, I I had this conversation with my son last night that I, I think about this often. He's doing today. He's He's doing he, the yeoman's work of a book talk. He has to go in and do a book report. And he's written a great little script and he has a great quote. And it's not from the first page of the book. So it's actually like, you know, he read it, which is great. That's always a great sign. Yeah, I have this great quote. It's on page two. No, you didn't even read the right. book. Come on, Joker. And he comes in and he says, you know, what if everybody's laughing at me? And I said, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Nobody cares. All these students in in your class who are watching you, they're picking their noses. Nobody cares what you have to say. Remember that, because that's really important. There's one person who actually cares, and that's your teacher, and she already likes you. So you're okay, <laughs> right? right? That, that, that should give you the opportunity. That should free you from some of that weight, that anxiety. Same thing happens when you have these giant projects that are, that are on your shoulders. Unless you are, you know, um, you work in NORAD or something, and you have the keys to the, to the you know, big red button, um, likely you're giving yourself too much uh control too much authority to let other people fail and uh it it's just it it's just mm-hmm. fear it's just fear and anxiety and you can you can walk out of that it'll make everything easier mm-hmm. to do once mm-hmm. you get to the other side of that part 
I love that. Yeah. And the only thing I have to add is that, you know, when we, it, it's sort of like, we're avoiding this for whatever reason, right? There's so many different reasons that you could be avoiding something. It could be avoiding a conversation, a project, a task, whatever it might be. But when you're sitting in that avoidance, that's like the worst anxiety pool yeah. ever, right? Truly. Because you just, you do, you have the weight on your shoulders. You're worried about the future. You're worried about the past. It's so anxiety driven that uh, it's like, you know, when you don't make a decision, that's making a decision it, it, that that place of indecision is just an awful place to be. And uh, I, I, you know, I think that if it's, if it's a conversation that you're trying to, to have with someone, or you have to apologize to someone, I know it's uncomfortable and it's going to take a lot of courage to pick up the phone or whatever you need to do. Um, But I have to say, I bet once you're done, you're going to feel so much lighter and be able to move on from it and free that that space in your brain to to, you know, pay attention to something else. And hopefully that is going to be less anxiety driven. Yeah. Um, But that's the only thing I have to add is that where she is or he is, is just a really ucky place to be. Yeah. It's really gross. So how do we get out of there? How do we get out? The ADHD podcast is brought to you by you. The reason we can do this show week to week, year after year, is thanks to the support of you, our listeners, at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. Your direct support pays for the resources we use to keep this show going after so many years. But today I want to talk about emergent behavior. We've talked about this on the show. This it's this mix of outcomes that springs forth when you when you put the right ingredients together, and and that is what has happened to this group. Uh, an example: the ADHD study hall. These amazing people hold each other accountable for work sprints. You, they use Zoom. They get on video with each other, and they keep themselves motivated. They keep each other motivated to study, to clean and organize, to to learn Hebrew. Like they do some amazing things together. Uh, Nikki and I didn't set this up. This is not something that we we put into place. It just happened because this community is full of dedicated and inspired people who want to see one another succeed. Uh, I find this deeply moving every time I log in. After a long weekend dealing with sick kids, I come in on Monday morning and see how well these people are taking care of one another. This community is here to help, and we hope you'll give the ADHD community a chance and support the show at the same time at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. You are what makes listener-supported podcasting like ours work. With a few dollars a month, you can help guarantee that we continue to grow the show, to add new features, and invest more heavily in our community. Get started again at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast today. We have some very quick follow-up that surprised me. Can I do this from last week? Yes. All right. Yeah, I, please. Uh, this, this comes from uh, Ellie, who's in the chat room. And uh, Ellie said something that I found, uh, it surprised me, but it warms me too. We talked about Marie Kondo a lot last week on the show. And and uh, I said that, uh, you know, one of the things that, that even though the Marie Kondo thing has, you know, it's impacted me positively, it's helped me get some things done in a new way. Uh, She says something really interesting that, uh, you know, when I said that Marie Kondo's style of just pour everything out on the on the bed and do it all and do all of your purging and storing and everything in one fell swoop, I my assessment was that that's not very ADHD friendly. And Ellie says the fact that this system is meant to be done all in one go instead of gradually means I get instant gratification for seeing results and clutter makes my symptoms worse, ironically. So the focus on de-junking as much as you can uh, you can up front is making me feel so much lighter and there are no complicated rules. It's just purge and store. And I love that because, again, it surprises me from an ADHD perspective and demonstrates we're on a very wide spectrum. Uh, right. So uh, yeah, thank you for yeah. that feedback. And, um, you know, in, in the, the condo approach to this stuff, it was uh, it was interesting. And I think it just confirms why it's so important that we all tweak what we learn, because we all are going to do it in a different way that works for us. So, um, yeah, I think that's great. Good for her. That's awesome. Yeah, I think so, too. OK, so we are talking today about sorting and purging. Yes. Uh, how do we do it? Step two. And we should say, as a as a point of uh, point of order, 
you should listen to these in order. If you haven't listened to last week's show, step one, and we talk, introduce the organizing process, uh, and uh, you should start there. So stop right now, go back and listen to that, and then come back. I 100% agree with that. Yeah, so step two in the process that I teach is is sorting and and purging. And basically what this is, is it's taking an inventory of what you own, right? So um, whether you take it all out and put it on the bed or you go, you know, section by section, it doesn't matter. What we're doing is we're really looking at everything that we have and we're deciding, you know, what does this matter? How does this matter to me? Is it important? Do I want it? Um, and again, going back to that great question, does it bring you joy? Yeah. Um, you know, so it really is just making a decision on what you want to do with this. And the reason this is important for, well, I think one of the biggest reasons this is important Um, to clarify is that we usually don't take the time to get organized, right? By the time you want to get organized, it's probably because you have a lot of clutter around you and something has, you know, um, it's, you've hit that toleration level. Yeah. Something's broken. Something's broken. And you're like, Oh, I've got to, I got to figure this out, you know? And, um, Everybody has a different toleration level. And so I think it's really important to to understand how much is too much for you. So, you know, somebody might um, think that having 100 books is fine because they have 100 bookcases, you know, or they have 50 bookcases they can put their books on. So not only can they store the 100 they have, they can store more, you know, and that's, fa- you know, it's fabulous. Um, some people may not want any clutter, you know, on their desk. And so they want to be able to have a system in place that that can um, be taken care of at the end of the day. There, There's no right or wrong. So again, going back to the whole premise that we were talking about earlier is that you just got to figure out what you are, what's right for you. How much do you want to keep um, without feeling, you know, like Burdened. it's smothering yeah. you? Well, and yeah. that's an interesting, the other side of that is, you know, to look at this, not with what brings you joy, but what, what causes pain, you know, right. you bring up yeah. the desk and I, I, I'm one of those people that I have to have a, a pretty straightened up desk because if I don't, I know that causes me such pain uh, and systems completely fall apart and I my I lose track of everything. I lose track of my sense of time and space and organization. And if, if my desk has clutter on it, I can't function. That causes me pain. It's not like my, you know, uh, this stack of invoices and receipts is going to, you know, it sparks necessarily joy. Right? Right, <laughs> There's right. very little little joy in there. But it does it does cause me pain when they stack up and they're not in a system. If, if my system falls out of a line, the, the toleration there is very, very shallow. If right. it falls out of line just a little bit, I, I lose it. And I don't like being in that state of losing it. Well, and I think that, you know, the bottom line is just getting to a point where you're comfortable in your space so that you can do work and that you can uh, relax in mm-hmm. your home, um, what, you know, or if you're at ho- if you're working, that you can do your work at home. I mean, I work from home. So that's where <laughs> that came from. <laughs> work and home merge for me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and bottom line, you know, my definition of organization, you have to find what you need when you need it. And um, that is really the core frustration that people have is they can't find stuff. And so, you know, getting to that point where, mm-hmm. where you're closer to that. So getting started, I think, is something that, again, um, A lot of times people start organizing because they're reacting to something um, and it's probably some kind of negative consequence. So they lost a really important paper or they lost they you know, they ended up getting um, another another item because even though they already had it, they had to buy it again. So now they're losing money. So, right, you're usually reacting to something. And so if we can get you to do this process before you're emotionally. Well, I use compromised. Compromised. Yeah, yeah there you go. Um, this is going to go smoother. Mm-hmm. So, you know, think about um, where, where you want to start. Get your get your supplies, whether that's just bags or boxes or if you want. I always think it's a great idea to have um, just blank paper so you can write on it to say like what it is. You know, if this is going to be donate. Yes. No. Um, if it's going to be a certain category, just to kind of keep it 
organized as mm-hmm. you're going through um, the sorting. Eliminate the distractions. Um, you know, put your phone away so you're not tempted to look at, you know, who's texting you or who's emailing you. Um, and that's a distraction. We are immediately going to go and look and see what's happening. And if you don't really want to be in this space right now organizing, you're going to find something else that's more important. So um, definitely get rid of that. Hire a babysitter if you have young kids. Um and also know that it's going to take longer than what you expect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I, I had uh, I had some advice from a former uh, manager once years ago who said, you know, especially when I was trying to move into to freelancing, who said, uh, yeah, take take how long you think it's going to last, then double it and then double that. Right. right. Double the result. Yeah. And so, you know, that that factor, that multiplication of time, I think, is is a pretty it's a pretty good start. But I think the other trick is set a timer. Right. To confirm right. it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, let's, sure. let's start testing assumptions and figure out if your assessment of time is is rational, because right. for many of us, it's not. And we have to learn uh, like Howard. This is this is the same thing with my you know, my wife always knows she's cup runs a couple minutes late. So she said, does that set the timer trick or set the clock trick right. and uh, that works for her but we have to do that too we have to learn how you know uh, what our our you know the way we interpret time how that is different from from normative right right well and what's interesting is that you know again depending on how much stuff you have is going to determine how much time you're putting into this process, right? Mm-hmm. The more stuff you have, the longer it's going to take. But it also depends on what you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at old boxes, you know, from call your college years or, you know, whatever, you're probably going to get stuck kind of reminiscing, yeah. you know, like, oh, wow, I haven't seen this in a long time. I'm going to look at this. And there is no doubt. I just posted a um a picture and it's just so funny on my Facebook page um, of what happens when people declutter and it's this woman sitting on her bed with this um, neck like you know one of those pillow neck things neck pillows right. and a mask and she's playing a DS and I mean, it's like all the stuff <laughs> she's found that she wants to like you know oh, I'm gonna try this on I'm gonna play this and it's so true we get you know kind of sucked into looking at these things but that's one of the things I want people to be really careful of is because it does slow you down and it can kind of stop the momentum because the energy you had going into it can, you know, definitely die down after playing a couple of games on your DS. So, (laughs) um, so with that said, I would just say, put those things aside so you can look at it later and just still focus on making decisions and keep going through the space or the boxes or whatever you're doing, but make it fun. Also, I think that sometimes, um, It can be kind of boring and it can take it takes longer and it feels like it takes longer because it's not necessarily where you want to be. And so, you know, play some music, listen to a podcast like ours. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Can I just tell you, you should set your podcast speed higher than normal. If you're if you're one of those people who listen to to audiobooks or podcasts at at one X speed, try setting it at one point five or one point seven five, depending on your player. And and I find that when other people, other people's voices are speed up in the media that I'm listening to, I speed up like I am. I am. I tend to move faster. I don't know if that works for everybody. Uh, I have not done any research on this, but just give it a shot and let me know, because that's. Yeah. That That's works interesting. for interesting. That's fun. Uh, working with other people, working with your family, not only can it be really helpful, um, they, they're also being the body double for you. And the person I probably don't want to work with is my husband because he'll justify <laughs> everything about why something needs to stay. So be careful with who you work with. <laughs> That's Make it the right person. Yeah. yeah. Um, little rewards along the way. I, I think I've mentioned this before, but this is a great idea as you're sorting and you're going through this process, you know, have some M&Ms next to you or oh, yeah. drink your, you know, favorite uh, soda or whatever. A scotch. Um, yeah. Some whiskey. No, don't, don't, you know. don't do that. Never drink and purge. <laughs> That could be you interesting. Just, it could go just, either way. You are going to throw yeah. everything away or you're going to keep you're everything. Keep everything. So, no, you're going to end up sitting right. alone on the floor because you'll throw out all your furniture and everything <laughs> that smells like an old life. Uh, you're, you're just gone and you'll be alone gone. crying. So please, please yeah. don't drink scotch and organize. No, no. Let, let, let's stay with, with water. Maybe. <laughs> right, right. Stay hydrated. Hydrate <laughs> stay and purge. Hydrated. Don't drink right. and purge. Right. Right. 
this is actually something. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is sort of something to avoid. Um, and that is trying to make a decision about where things are going to go while you're in step two, which is sorting. So one of the things that I've made very clear in my online course is that you do step one, you do step two, and then you do step three. But if you try to do step two and three at the same time, which is sorting and then also putting it back, it can be really overwhelming for a lot of people. It may not be for everyone, but I can tell you the majority of people that I've talked to, they get stuck then because they're not sure where it should go. And if they have a lot of stuff in their home, it can really be um, damaging because they really don't know where it's going to go because they don't feel like they have any space for it to even land right now. Well, and yeah, and that gets to the the issue of like, let's say you take on a closet. If you're trying to do the, the sort and purge and then like put back, you're going to naturally keep more stuff, I think, because there's a natural habit to just, well, you know, I'm organizing, which really means I'm just folding more pristinely. You know, yes. I mean, when yeah. we did our, our closet recently, we got rid of a ton of stuff as a result of doing the 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 purge first and, and not thinking about the, the space. Because then it keeps you focused on just one thing. One, right. you have one one point. And that is just to make a decision whether or not something's staying or going. So it releases some of that stress, I think, for yeah. sure. Um, and, and, and organizing is stressful for a lot of people. So we want to, you know, try to uh, decrease that as much as we can. Yes. Um, focusing on one space at a time. You know, I've gone back and forth on this a little bit because sometimes, you know, you get bored and you want to do something else. I can tell you that in my experience, when you zigzag and you go from room to room, it's really frustrating uh, because you don't see your progress. You don't remember where you left off. Um, and, and you may get back into some of those limiting beliefs of what's the point? Why am I even doing this? So I'm still supporting that you work in one space at a time. Um, and one of the things that can really help when you're doing that is that when you notice that there is something that doesn't belong in the space that you're organizing, but you want to keep it, put it in a relocate box. That is probably one of the best solutions I've seen so that people don't get distracted in the other room that they were going to put that stuff in um, and you'll deal with it later. So, you know, it's not in your current space and you'll deal with it later. So think about other, a relocate other box. rooms while you are while you are orga uh, sorting and organizing our spider webs. Right. I mean, they're right. sticky. They you they want to keep you. They yeah. lure you in and suddenly you're doing something completely different. Yeah. Something very different. Yeah. So. You know, this was the, the last few tips have really been kind of getting you started kind of in that mindset. But you got to take action, right? You got to do something. <laughs> you can't just plan all day. Um, so oh, definitely, you can. You really well, can. You can. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you the avoidance strategy doesn't work, especially when it comes to, to sorting and, right. and purging. So we got to take some action. And I'm going to go back to what your advice was, is you break it up. You break it up. So if this is really overwhelming for you, don't feel like you have to you know, take all your clothes out at once or whatever, you can break your spaces up into zones. So just to give you kind of an example, if you're going to be organizing your kitchen, uh, maybe for today, you're going to do just your pantry and then you're going to do a, you know, a particular cupboard. You can break it up like that. Go through these steps and just focus on that one area. Same thing like with the garage. I need to take advice, my own advice here. Mm hmm. Just focus on the tools. Just focus on what's in the boat. What's in the get boat? Get what's in the boat out of the boat, <laughs> unless it's boating stuff, and then right. it can stay in the boat. But I'll tell you, breaking that down really, I mean, it helps. It helps to kind of see it that way, because then you're not just looking at everything and thinking, I'm going to shut the door again, which is what I've been doing. Right. So it does definitely um, help you get started. Same thing with the with the closet. If you don't want to put everything or if you don't want to take everything out, just do your shoes. Look at just your shirts. Look at just your pants, your dresses, like really kind of break it down. Um, another thing that I will tell people to do is kind of work clockwise 
in your uh, space. Like, so if you're organizing your bedroom, pick a corner of your room and just sort of work, you know, around it. Um, I have a lady that I'm working with right now who has a craft room. And so, you know, everything to the left is all craft scrapbooking stuff. Everything to the right is um fabric and she didn't want to go through the fabric first so we just started right in the corner and she's going to go and do her scrapbooking and like her um buttons and all that stuff yeah. first. so you can choose whichever one feels better to you um but you know that's uh that there's a lot of different ways to do it and i think that's the bottom line there's this real practical uh kind of decision-making muscle that many of us don't have and many of us believe deeply that we are incapable of of strengthening it. And that's a limiting belief that we have to identify and really see what it's protecting you from, how it's serving you, and what do you want different. Yes. Because you are capable. You can change, you know, change this. And again, if you're not comparing yourself to... It, well, the comparison is kind of the sabotage. If you yeah. think your house needs to be um, the, the, if you think organization is what you see in books and magazines, then yeah, you're going to be disappointed. But if right. you can find a level of this is good enough, this is just fine. I can, I can function. I'm at peace. Then um, you can certainly get there. So how do you, uh, how do you start building that decision-making muscle? Make the easy ones first. All right. That's what I always tell everybody is you got to make the easy decisions first, easy decisions first. And we all have them. So I don't want people to think, but they're all hard because then what we're doing is we're doing all or nothing thinking. Yeah. We're going to identify that as an ADHD challenge. That's what's happening here. And we're going to break through that. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. You have easy decisions to make. So that's what you got to start with. And you'll know within just seconds, right, yeah. whether this is something that you want to keep or not. If you have any doubt, you keep it. If you don't know, you keep it, but you keep moving on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the biggest thing. It's, you know, I, I kind of imagine it, you know, those chess timers, you know, that you, you see the championship chess players smacking the chess timer. You know that how that works? i uh, never seen that. Oh, Ever? no, it's great. If you see if you see people <laughs> playing chess in a park, right, they'll always have this yes. chess timer that has two little clocks on it and you slam oh, okay. it and it's like the decision. Like, it keeps track of the total play time for each player. Every time every time the other person plays it, it starts your clock again. And I feel like this is an example of when a chess timer type thing is useful, where you can just smack it whenever you make a decision and see, like, look at the progress I'm making. Look at how quickly I'm moving through these decisions. Right. I have, you know, I've hit, I've taken care of all my shoes and it, it really only took me six minutes like yes. that was that surprised me i built it up much larger than that and now i've accomplished something and that creates momentum you bet absolutely i love that you say that get a little chest timer click it get a chest Slam timer it. smack it <laughs> smack it That's well, it. that goes on it we need another shirt smack it smack adhd it. that's right yeah. that's right well and something that you know once because it, it does feel good and it does feel good to see the progress you're making and so once you've made those easy decisions take a step back and look at your space and where you're at and what you've done and how does this make you feel and do you need to take a break that's fine. Take yeah. a break. <laughs> right. Uh, because look at what you've done. Look at what you've created. And so, um, you know, I think it's it's a really it can be a very positive thing. But if it's not at the point where it's good enough for you, then mm -hmm. you have to go back to that second sort. And then you're taking what was you've already made the easy decisions. Right. But now you have to face some of the harder decisions. Some of the maybes. Yeah. Right. Because some things are easy to know that you're going to keep them. So keep them. You yeah. Know, you're not right. going to we're not right. reviewing those things again. So, so look, yeah, let's talk about the what are the kinds of questions that you ask yourself to help move you through and again, not get stuck on these questions. These may be questions that may be harder. Right. Some of them are going to sound familiar, but then I want to dig in just a little deeper on them. You probably have heard the thing. Well, if you haven't used it in a year, you don't need it. All right. Well, mm -hmm. That might be true, and that may, that may be an easy way for you to decide. But I want to know, if you haven't used it in a while, what stopped you from using it? 
Yeah. Like, why didn't you? If it's something in your kitchen, maybe you stopped making that dish. You don't make, right. you know, bunt cakes anymore. Do you need right. the bunt pan? Or you forgot you had it in the first place, and now that you know you have it, you want to use it. And you're going to go okay. on a full 100% bunt diet and <laughs> absolutely, and you're going to make diet. bunt cakes for neighbors and everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're going to have a bake sale. <laughs> <laughs> I, all of my salmon cakes are now bunt salmon cakes. Yes, I'm we're going them. full bunt here at the ADHD yeah. podcast. Yeah, yes. So, okay. but that's really what I want to know: is what stopped you? Did you forget about it? Do you really not care about it? Um, you know, we got to figure out. Like, just because you haven't used it in the last year doesn't. It, it's not enough for me. I need uh -huh. to know more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you were to use it again, so say you've decided, yes, I'm going to keep this, then if if I was working with you, I would want to know, okay, specifically tell me when. Give me a day, a time, a yes. reason of why you would use this bunt cake. Like immediately. Will you really <laughs> yeah. like will you really have a bake sale? You know, yeah. um, are you really gonna make a salmon bunk cake? Cause that just sounds awful. <laughs> you never know unless you try it, Nick Spencer. That's true. That's true. go full bunt, all bunt but all I, the time. But I, what I'm hoping people see is that you're taking it a little bit further. Like really think about when you're gonna use it. And if you really can't see that, then yeah. get rid of it. Right. What's the worst thing that can happen if you let this go? I mean, really, what are we fearing? Because if we're fearing about something, you know, well, we're probably fearing that if we let it go, we're going to regret it. All right. What happens if you do regret it? Can you borrow it from somewhere? Can you actually go and buy it again and think, OK, I'm going to keep this this time? I'm if we've learned more. anything about our own <laughs> kitchen cabinets, it's that everybody has a bunt cake pan yeah, somewhere that they're not somewhere. using. You can probably get another one easily. Exactly. So we just have to really think about what's the worst thing. Um, could somebody else use it more than me? Yeah. Does my neighbor, she just moved here from Georgia. Does she need a bunt cake? Maybe. <laughs> she does. Maybe, you know, because she probably got rid of all of her stuff before she made the big move. That's right. And, you know, so that's we're kind of making light of it. But it really is, I mean, important to think it could somebody else use this more than me? Because is it if it's just sitting in your drawer, if it's just sitting in the back of a cupboard and it's doing absolutely nothing, um, you know, what's the purpose, right? That's what we have to think about. I, I think of it like that, that, you know, empty. So let's say you get rid of the bunt cake pan. I don't right. know why you would after all we've built up. I know, up after everything that we've talked about. The full bunt lifestyle, yeah. yeah. Uh, but let's say you get rid of it. Empty space that that bunt cake pan would have been in, empty space is opportunity, right? right? Empty space is opportunity for growth. Leaving that bunt cake in is hoarding, right? You're not using it. Yes. If it's just taking up space, you're, it, it is, it, it's, you don't need it. You don't want to condition yourself to that kind of behavior. That's yes. that's huge. That's huge. It is huge. It's and it's okay to have empty space. It does yeah. not everything has to be filled. So uh, absolutely. Well, and this last question I would say, is it worth the real estate it's taking up? And that's really what you're saying is, you know, should we uh, is it is it worth that space that it's taking in the cupboard is it a, you know would it feel better to have empty space there would it be feel better to have a casserole dish instead because you make casseroles more than you make butt cakes right i mean well maybe if you're the casserole lobby yeah exactly <laughs> all right few additional tips and then we're going to uh wrap it up all right sorting is emotional and uh, and and it's a lot more emotional than what people realize. So not only can it be physically demanding, it's also um, emotionally draining. Uh, so I definitely recommend working with other people, um, whether that's a body double, an accountability partner, a friend, a neighbor, a family member. Um, ADDers are verbal processors. They like to hear the questions from somebody else and then they like to talk about it they like to they they need to because that's how they're organizing their thoughts plus you're getting a second opinion from someone else that all of a sudden maybe you didn't think of it that way and um and now it's easier for you to let something go so if this is a struggle if you really have a struggle of letting things go work with someone mm -hmm. when the dis easy decisions become hard and maybe it's not even the easy decisions, but when any decision becomes hard, it is time to take a break. 
walk away from it because for whatever reason you've been triggered, you're emotionally drained and you need to take a break from it. And uh, if you are leaving, you know, for more than just a few minutes and you're taking, uh, you know, a few days off or whatever, mark where you left off, you know, um, put some kind of like have a paper piece of paper together just to kind of say what you did and where you where you left off um and that's going to that's going to help you be able to get started again um and i think another really important thing for people to understand is that purging is not just a one time event it is something that's going to continue to happen even when you go into steps 3 and 4 um so it's okay to keep what you need to keep Mm-hmm. And knowing that, you know, when you get to step three and four, you very well may change your mind and that's OK. Um, so I just don't want people to think it's like this one event that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be stressful. So I love it. I love it. And I love, you know, it, it, being able to set yourself for yourself some rules around what you decide to keep and the space. It, it could very well be that you have this beautiful empty shelf and you decide that that one book that you gave away that you thought you were going to give it. You can grab it out of the box. You can put yeah. it back on your shelf. You can, sure. There are take backs in this game. Yes, absolutely. Great conversation, Nikki Kinzer. Thank you so much. Step two. So step three, when we think about homework for next week, what do you want people to think about? Well, I think that now is just really picking that space and and sorting and purging and going through the process that we talked about today. And then next week, what we're going to be doing is is actually talking about how to place things back um, so that they make sense to you. So you know what? I encourage everybody just to, to take a few minutes and see what happens. How does it feel to make those easy decisions? I have a pretty, I mean, like I have a pretty good idea. People are going to have a very positive reaction to it. I think so too. I think it's always easier than you think it's going to be. Uh, Yes. So there you go. Thank you everybody for downloading, listening to this show. We certainly appreciate your time and attention on behalf of Nikki Kinzer. I'm Pete Wright and we'll catch you next week right here for step three on taking control, the ADHD organizing podcast.